So welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to join you to have you all join us today for a conversation about curating black art today, uh, which we're hosting here at the Museum of Art. Um, the museum has been building a collection of black art from the US, from Africa and from the wider diaspora for about 20 years now. Kay Wilson really started us off on this process when she was our curator of the collection, adding works by John Wilson, Dox Thrash, Elizabeth Catlett, Charles White, Hale Woodruff and others. And Dan has been strengthening these acquisitions more recently with pieces by Carol Walker, Gordon Parks, William Villalongo, Damon Davis, Paul Sapuya, currently on view, and contemporary African artists, Prince Giasi, Aida Moulinet, and Marcia Curé, among others. Um, and then they both worked together on our recent Jacob Lawrence acquisition. Um, and it's really exciting that these acquisitions now form the backbone of Professor Freda Rivera's course, which we are now about to wrap up on Black art and visual culture, which is great. Um, several years ago, when we opened the national tour of reckoning with the incident, John Wilson studies for a lynching mural. We learned a really valuable lesson in dealing with race. Despite our best of intentions, we really had to stop, slow down and listen to our community, especially our community of color in reckoning with this topic. And I would say personally, I thought the result was far more powerful in terms of programming and engagement, which included many voices and helped me and I hope others see the art in lots of new ways. So the work we do at Grinnell falls within the larger context of changing museum practice, expanding not only we have in the collection, but how decisions get made and by whom across the institution and the museum industry. Uh, today's conversation will take us into some of those questions. Fari Nzinga is a visiting assistant professor and postdoctoral curatorial fellow at Kalamazoo College for her PhD in cultural anthropology from Duke University. She conducted doctoral research, doctoral research on New Orleans based black art and cultural organizations after Hurricane Katrina. She went on to be a Mellon ACLS Public Fellow at the New Orleans Museum of Art, or NOMA, where she co-founded the Color Block, an information and resource sharing platform for the professional advancement of New Orleans-based artists and art professionals of color. She, she independently curated the exhibition, The Rent is Too Damn High in 2018 for the New Orleans Tricentennial. Dr. Nzinga is a member of Dismantle, no, hashtag Dismantle Noma, a collective of former New Orleans Museum of Art staff members directly challenging the culture of racism in that institution. I know her class at Kalamazoo College has already been meeting with Professor Rivera's class, and she'll bring her work as a teacher, a curator, and a cultural activist to our conversation today. Mikhail Solomon's work focuses on increasing the market for artists from the African diaspora. She is the founder of PRISM, an annual art fair that has taken place during Art Basel, Miami Beach since 2013, becoming the pre prominent private art fair focused on contemporary okay. black art. Mikhail received her Master's of Architecture from Florida International University and works in both advocacy and design. Her work with PRISM has considered the local and global context of the Black diaspora, and PRISM has become a critical space for engagement and networking. Ms. Solomon will share insights from PRISM's most recent virtual iteration of the art fair and their approach to a virtual program in an age of pandemics. And I believe with this crowd, Professor Fredo Rivera needs no introduction. And I am looking forward to turning the program over to to Professor Rivera and hearing our conversation get started. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Leslie, and greetings. I wanna thank, for those of us who are out today, I know it's Monday evening, the last week of the term, I guess is our new version of what we're not supposed to call any more Hell Week. Um, but welcome. Um, when I, uh, thank you for coming this evening, and it's an honor for me to welcome our two guests today. Um, when I came up with the idea for coordinating this event, um, I was thinking about my current course, Black Art, 
Um, and in some ways, historically, we're looking at the role of the museum institutions in the art world um, and looking at these debates that sort of form around the meaning of black art, the, what is black art, um, how we can think of beauty, aesthetics, et cetera. Um, and I wanted to have a discussion really thinking about this past year that related to sort of our current political moment and thinking about the art world and the museum. Um, so in many ways, I'm hoping that this discussion sort of brings us forward at the end of our course as we're thinking, but I, I reached out to the museum because I thought this was a prominent discussion to be having at the moment um, and thinking about broadly. Um, one of the very exciting things in this class has been working with the museum, um, working with Jocelyn to identify works in the collection, um, working with the new acquisitions ranging from Jacob Lawrence to Paul Sepoya. Um, it's like this has been sort of um, very exciting within a classroom setting. Um, and um, we're doing this event within a period in our class where we're thinking about um, the role of art and its public interfaces, particularly in this moment. And we're looking at three case studies, actually four case studies, New Orleans, Miami, Cape Town, and St. Louis. I'm very excited that we will have Damon Davis, who is in residence with the museum um, in our class, joining us tomorrow. If anyone. So I, I'm just very excited to have this sort of critical conversation and maybe even think about how these conversations relate to the work we're doing um, in the classroom and at the museum here in Grinnell. Um, as curators, scholars, and coordinators, um, both of our guests have engaged in projects that center Black artists um, and um, critical thinking around the African diaspora. Um, and I, I want to say they're both um, wonderful friends. Fari, um, Fari and I especially, I would go as far as to refer to Fari as my grad school bestie. Um, we've had um, lots of fun adventures around the world, lots of critical discussions about art and the meaning of life. Um, and um, I won't, um, I'll, and then Mikhail is a Miami native. I, I don't want to get into too many details of why I think they're awesome, but I will say that um, they did meet each other uh, nearly a decade ago in Miami between the three of us. Um, and for me, it's been very exciting to see, because this was um, before Mikhail started PRISM, um, before Fari had completed her PhD and started her work at NOMA and doing more of her work in New Orleans. So just as, as sort of a person and friend, it's one of the exciting moments to see your friends engage with the world, with, with the art world and do some really critical, amazing things. So it's an honor to have you both here. Um, and I'm particularly excited to talk about um, your work in relation to the topic of black art, the role of museums, um, and the work you both do, particularly with networking with contemporary artists. Um, but I'd like to ask you first, what's a project you are currently working on that excites you? I can go first. Um, uh, so um, with PRISM, you know, as you mentioned earlier, we had to pivot from um, hosting our fairs um, in person physically um, as a result of COVID-19 and um, trying to abate the spread of it. So um, we had to um, pivot to an online a virtual fair, which um, initially was very scary for me. Um, it required a lot of technical <laughs> um, massaging that I wasn't as uh, as uh, familiar with with doing, but I, it was a learning process for me. But what I found that what it, what it did is actually opened up um, um, Prism Prism's curb appeal to a more global global audience. Uh, whereas when we typically host the fair in person, we have about thousands of attendees. We were able to attract millions of of of, of viewers through our partnerships and our our cultural partnerships with like Artsy and you know various institutions like you know the Perez Art Museum and um, the Bass Art Museum and other other museum partnerships that we do have, as well as partnerships with um, cultural organizations like you know. Um, the laundromat project in New York um, and Museum Hue. So um, I think it was uh, the virtual fair was very interesting. It was a very interesting beta test for us because I, I was I was fearful that we would lose momentum as a result of having to pivot to an online platform. But it was the exact opposite. Um, and um, we we a lot of a lot of the artists that participated in the fair got a lot a lot of interest. Um, the fair garnered a lot of interest as well, um, having having our our programming and all of all of the um, content online. 
Um, so that so that's something we we intend to continue doing. We actually um, want to be able to host a virtual fair twice a year, whereas you know last year we only did it once. I think it gives us the opportunity to um, do it as many times as we want to, or or have ongoing programming throughout the year. Whereas before we were sort of limited to doing programming one time um, in one year, one time a year. And then additionally um, to the actual virtual pivot, we're also working on uh, launching a residency program uh, that we'll have here in Miami, which I can't really say much too much about currently, but it's definitely um, uh, something that uh, a program that we are interested in launching, hopefully in August of this year, and we are going to be doing it in partnership with uh, uh, an organization that's based in Accra, Ghana. So those are two exciting projects. <laughs> could we, before we get to Fari's response, backtrack a little, and could you talk a little bit about how you started PRISM? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, I, uh, uh, if we go a little bit further back than that, even like I grew up in Miami, um, and uh, you know when you're when you live in a place your whole entire life, you you just think that it's just not good enough, and you want to you want to see other places. So when I was when I was younger, I always thought that Miami just didn't have the cultural offerings that I was looking for. Uh, and then it, it it took me leaving Miami and going to going to other places to realize um, how 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 wrong I was. I, you know, I, I missed Miami and realized how culturally rich actually Miami is. Um, and and coming back, uh, I wanted to participate and, and contribute to 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 it in some way. Um, I visited several art fairs um, in grad school um, and noticed that there just wasn't, there wasn't as much representation, um, diverse representation at art fairs and wanted to see more of it. Um, and so I just sort of galvanized whatever resources I personally had to create um, PRISM as a platform. Um, I, at the time I was working on other arts projects I met several art artists who wanted to see something like what PRISM is now, um, uh, engaging the artistic space in Miami during Art Basel Week. Um, and um, that was a lot of the chatter that I'd heard from, no from a number of artists who felt like they were included in the, in the, in the international dialogue that exists here in, in December. Uh, so um, that, that's kind of like, that was the genesis or the, um, or the, or the um, momentum that spurred um, the, the the establishment of Prism. Yeah. Thank you, and Fari. Thank you so much for that introduction um, and for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm just so excited and, and grateful. So one thing that I'm working on right now is an exhibition, a small exhibition that's going to take place in New Orleans at the Stella Jones Gallery. Um, and it's part of a larger project called Deep South by Suroeste, which is a project that brings together New Orleans artists and artists from San Antonio. Um, that was at least the the mission when it was an event that happened in person, you know, every iteration. Now that things are rearranging during COVID, there's a little bit more wiggle room. And so this iteration is really um, trying to tell a larger story around conversations that, that are happening between Black and Latina um, communities. Um, so, I'm really excited about it. I am happy to share the call for submissions, which closes at the end of this week. Um, but part of what I love to do uh, um, as a curator who is kind of learning to become a curator and, and trying to get better each time that I practice um, is to create spaces and moments of cross-cultural dialogue um, and to have conversations that meaningfully discuss not just what is beautiful, but also what is possible in the realm of political action um, and political imagination. So I'm really excited about it. Thanks for asking that question. 
pleasure. Um, that that really has me thinking. When I think of both of when I think of both of you and the work you do, um, networking plays a really important role. And, and thinking about sort of this networking of Black artists, whether it's through sort of the realm of the art fair or the exhibition. And and I was thinking, Farah, you were just in my class sharing about your exhibition, The Rent is Too Damn High. Um, and thinking about that, how that itself, while it was focused on New Orleans-based artists, created a network. And I'm also thinking of your recent work in Michigan. So I was wondering if you both could sort of speak about how you approach networking, um, engaging artists, um, sort of bringing people together. Um, I know, Far, you've also could talk a little bit about your work with Color Block. I'll share the link for that too. So. Sure. Um, so I was just talking about this in your class, but um, in 2014, I was working at the New Orleans Museum of Art for two years as an ACLS fellow, and I became uh, much more aware of all of the information and resources that I now had access to thanks to this institutional affiliation. And I felt like it needed to go beyond the walls of the museum. It needed to travel to um, the studios and desks um, and get in front of um, the eyes of Black artists and artists of color who are working in New Orleans and, and really trying to um, hone their crafts. So I co-founded a network called The Color Block, which Fredo has so graciously shared the link to in the chat. And initially it was just about trying to create a clearinghouse for this type of information, um, rather than each time I get something, have to like email people individually. Now I have a network of folks who can lay eyes on something um, and circulate it that way. Um, so I'm really excited about creating that network and maintaining that network, growing and building that network. Um, because as we've seen um, in 2020 and into 2021 with the emphasis on mutual aid, um, we have to be taking charge of how we share information and resources. We have to be building the models. We have to be um, creating the platforms and the venues. Uh, because even though there seemed to be a moment of racial reckoning in this country um, in June of 2020, it feels as though um, it feels as though there's still a lot of work to be done. There's still a lot more conversations to be had, and there's still more to do. There's so much to do, um, and so this. It, so the idea of networking is really about how can I. Um, be in community with, in contact with, in dialogue with people with whom I can build. Yeah, I mean, I think to add to um, um, Fari's um, um, poignant points, um, you know, with PRISM, you know, PRISM is, is in essence a massive network of, of artists whose works, whose work is aligned not only through, you know, the actual visual aesthetic, but through, through its, its dialogue and the conversations that are are propagated through the work. Um, and oftentimes a lot of the artists that participate in PRISM know each other. They're all they're all they're all connected and know know each other's work very well. Um, and uh, what we try to do is just be a conduit for their or a pipeline for their professional growth. Um, so you'll see that uh, a number of the artists that matric matriculate, I like to say through through PRISM, um, typically um, end up having exhibitions um, after the fact, or they'll um, you know participate in larger symposia. So it's it's really um, and I'm also constantly in dialogue with the artists that participate in the fair as well. Um, and we I do studio visits with with the artists um, routinely. I mean that's had to I've had to sort of. Um, hone that back a little bit because of our current situation. I'm not traveling as much, but I, I do also try to stay in dialogue um, with the artists that participate in the fair. And I mean, we we essentially have a network of about 500 artists at this point. Um, so uh, it it is in of itself like a, a network and a, an ecosystem 
um, the, the the art fair. And it's it's really not just an art fair. It kind of has legs beyond just being an art fair um, at this point. Awesome, thank you. Um, I guess I wanna connect with, um, you were mentioning sort of this past year, Fari, in June 2020. Um, and I was thinking this past year, my, for me, at least for me, it's felt very sort of revelatory uh, and piercing to say the least. Um, and, and really thinking about this moment of national and global protests, um, particularly around the activism with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, have really in some ways demanded introspection and even a dismantling of forms of racial violence and racism, um, including at the institutional level. Um, and I'm thinking of how this is extended to the space of the museum and the art world. And um, if either or both of you could speak to how the past year has impacted your field of work. And, and Fari, I was wondering if you could specifically talk to us about your work with um, hashtag Dismantle Noma, how you became part of their collective and the mission of the work. Sure. Um, so in May and June of 2020, uh, it came to light that there have been several um, killings by police of unarmed black people, some of whom included um, Breonna Taylor, um, Tony McDade, Ahmaud Arbery, right? And so as people were circulating those stories and those images online, it felt as though institutions like schools and museums that um, purport to serve specific communities um, that they felt they you know needed to address this. And this was thank you to the social movements that you mentioned, Fredo, right? Because everybody who works in these fields already knew that this was going on, but it wasn't it wasn't making it past the threshold of I actually have to stake a claim in this um, conversation until people started to hit the streets, right? So then all of a sudden you had like open letters coming out, you had um, posts, you had the like black square on Instagram on that infamous day, right? And everyone was trying to figure out within the realm of social media and the internet how to best express their solidarity, their righteous indignation, if you will. And um, having, you know, been a staff member at NOMA, having been there on an external fellowship um, that, you know, always touted how many people were brought into the permanent workforce at the host institution where they did their fellowship. I was excited about, you know, the possibility of continuing my work there. Um, but I realized that they really didn't want to have me there. <laughs> so in 2020, when the museum puts up this, you know, post about, you know, we're anti-racist, um, it rang hollow. And so I was invited to what is now the Dismantle Noma Collective um, in June of 2020. There have been several folks who had stepped away from the museum and who were having conversations well before these um, killings became you know, public knowledge about what they were gonna do and how they were going to share their stories having been the victims of um, harassment due to race um, and due to gender presentation and sexuality. Um, and so it was kind of the last straw for that group when they saw Noma coming out in the social media streets talking about, you know, oh, we are an anti-racist institution. Um, and at that point, they were like, hey, there's five of us. We want you to be the sixth member. We have this letter that we're that we're, we want to drop publicly. Um, what do you think? And so I came on board and we were on a Zoom call for, I kid you not, like six hours going through the letter that we would eventually publish on um, June 24th, I wanna say. And um, it outlined some egregious moments of you know, racial bias and aggression and abuse 
that had taken place and that we realized were not simply isolated incidents. So we came together, we talked about our experiences and we wanted to support one another. Um, and we, rec we recognized that we were the ones who had something to say about it, but we probably weren't the only ones. And that's why we wanted to drop the letter publicly, which you can find on um, www.dismantlenoma2020.com. Um, and so from there, you know, we opened the letter up. We got like 500 signatures you know, before the end of the day of the first, you know, on the first day that we dropped it, we had people, artists, community members speak out against the institution and, you know, and really describe the relationships um, that they had had with the institution and how damaging they were. Um, and we realized over time that this is something we have to link to a larger social movement. And this is something that if we're being honest, we have to find new ways to be generative. We have to find new ways to support. We have to find new ways to create what it is that we want to see because the museum's response was to just pretend that we didn't exist, not to ever mention us publicly, not to acknowledge our list of 13 demands for the museum um, and, and not to engage with us. Um, so, you know, they're thinking this is just one moment that will pass like so many others have before it, and they should just wait out the storm. And so our strategy initially was about putting pressure on the museum and raising public awareness. And now we're moving into a new phase of strategy where we're really trying to create the conditions that we wish were present at NOMA. So we want to have more exhibitions that are celebrating and highlighting the work of New Orleans and Louisiana based artists of color. So that's what we're going to do rather than simply channel all of our energy back to this museum that's already stolen so much from us. So I'm sorry if that was very long winded, but I wanted to give a bit of context around um, the Dismantle Noma movement. And you are more than welcome to go to the website, read the um, letter, read the demands. And if you feel so moved, feel free to sign on as well. Freda, would you mind just re reiterating the question again? Because I know it was a, it was a little pretty long question. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I know. Essentially what the question was asking was how the past year has impacted your work. Um, thinking with a, a lot of the events that happened. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because um, prior to last year's events, we um, every year we craft the um, the exhibition of the work and the programming that we have at the at the at our fair around this specific narrative or a curatorial framework. Um, and and in 20, 2019, right before 2020, the framework was titled Love in the Time of Hysteria. And it seemed like fairly uh, prescient, I suppose, because everything just sort of like <laughs> snowballed into a great big mess last year um, that unfortunately de devolved into um, us having, well, really wasn't really a devolution, it was more like us um, uh, confronting uh, what was already under the surface anyhow. Um, and um, so, you know, for us and for, for me, PRISM has always been, um, a, I guess, somewhat of an act of resistance um, and a, an organization that was built to um, address what I knew was already a problem in, institutionally and, and globally. Um, and um, it's been very interesting to see how institutions are responding to um, uh, to what what ha what what transpired last year, um, um, you 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 see that there there is and and I think many many have been asking for this for quite some time for for diversity in representation in like staff and um, and and um, important roles in muse in, in in museums and institutions um, nationally, uh, but now we're 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 seeing it happening. Um, 
almost globally. And um, and it's it's great to see um, a number of um, curators um, of color being appointed to important positions in museums so that we can reframe um, what what cultural institutions, how or how cultural institutions are supposed to interface with society um, and 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 what what those what the narratives of the work that's being shown should be and um, and how it should welcome um, a, a, a country that is very diverse. Um, um, so for me, the work what what happened last year was, it, you know, everything that was unfolding was kind of like I, I was like I already knew this was happening, and like, um, and for me, Prism was was already kind of doing the work that needed to be done um, to um, kind of um, create equity um, and a more just cultural landscape. Um, but I feel I feel like um, what happened last year was uh, unfortunately happened because. We weren't we weren't seriously dealing with um, what our country just was refusing to address, and you know I think what Fari and Dismantle Noma was doing was absolutely necessary, um, and um, and um, I'm I'm looking forward to see how things continue to evolve. I, I pray that it's not just a, a trend. Um, I know that sometimes we tend to um, have these conversations and then you know as things i guess evolve we kind of forget that these things happen and things go back to the status quo but i i really do hope that things continue to progress in um um in a fashion where where we can all have um difficult discussions but have them diplomatically and in a way that allows us to really uh, move forward in a more equitable and just way Thank you. Um, I, I I agree with that, and and I, and in relation to sort of what you are both was saying, uh, you know, I mentioned sort of this year has been a year where there has been sort of this notable reckoning, but at the same time, our work continues. And in another sense, um, thinking about sort of the invisibility that might happen in some of these processes within the museum world, something I think Dismantle Noma is addressing and, and really sort of. Um, critical ways has me also thinking about sort of a recent trend of embracing sort of black art. Um, I would even go as far as to say, and, and this has actually come up in our readings, looking at black art from the 90s onwards, sort of this combination of invisibility and hypervisibility. And I do think we're in sort of, if we think about the art world and the museum world, a moment of hypervisibility with black art. And I'm just thinking alone here in Miami, we've had several exhibitions. We currently have the Allied with Power. African and African diaspora art from the George M. Perez um, exhibition at PAM. Um, we've had, um, along with, as I mentioned, several others at the Des Moines Art Center this past fall, there was the Black Stories exhibition, which was curated by local artists um, in Des Moines, Jordan um, um, Weber and um, Mitchell Squire. Um, and even in Grinnell, we're celebrating some of our recent acquisitions and displaying a lot of that art. Um, and in our class, we watched the new HBO documentary that came out last month on Black art in the light of absence, um, which I think really sort of highlighted these thoughts of like, th this is a hyper visible moment. And I'm wondering what sort of what are your thoughts on this moment specifically um, when Black art is in the limelight and what narratives are perhaps missing? What resources are needed to sort of um, support Black art in the long term in a sustainable way? You know, like I, I so I had an opportunity, I watched I watched um, the the, uh, the HBO documentary too, uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. David Driscoll was one of my was one of my mentors. Um, so it was kind of uh, great to see his work celebrated in this in this way. Um, and then of course you saw, um, you know, organ like important organizations like Studio Museum, and you know artists that are you know Mark Bradford and your and your. Um, Valerie Cassell Oliver, she's an amazing curator, um, curator um, Thelma Golden. Um, um, I think I think that I think there needs to be more documentaries like it. Um, uh, that maybe it should be a, a series, quite frankly, because there's such a there's such a dearth of information 
um, that that um, exist in the the, the African diaspora um, canon art arts canon that so many people don't know about. And it's so I mean, we 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 all know Thelma Godin. We all know Valerie because all because their art, their work is pervasive. But I think, and we know David Driscoll, but I think there's so many incredible people doing work in this field. Um, and I think there needs to be a place where people can easily access that information too. And I mean, unless you're in, unless you're in the, in, in the field, the way we are, and we are sort of entrenched and we, we are committed to research, um, you wouldn't, you wouldn't easily be able to access it. I don't think, I still don't feel like what we do on a daily basis is easily accessible to the masses. Um, and, and so I really, I really love that they, that. I think that was a, a, a good a great first pass and I would love to see more of that like maybe HBO should do uh, uh, like a whole like like multi multi um, a, a, a multi season series on black art in America um, and uh, and not just in America quite frankly like in, on, 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 on the entire globe right in Africa as well um, because you know we know how work um, how art from Africa is inspired. Um, many people. Um, it, it not, it's not. It's not. It's not just the diaspora that that have impact that have been impacted by work from Africa, but the European art has been um, has effect has been uh, affected. And Western canons have been affected and influenced by um, African art as well. Um, so I would just love to see more of that. More more household names, <laughs> like more black artists becoming household names and it becoming as important to say Elenatsui as it is to say um, uh, Picasso or as important for us to say um, uh, Rashid Johnson or, you know, Hank Willis Thomas or Stenjoa Luthuli, right? Like those names need to be just as important as saying um, uh, Rothko or, you know, whomever else uh, you can you can think of. Um, so yeah, those are my thoughts. <laughs> I 100 and a million percent agree with everything you just said, Mikhail. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to share, and this is being recorded, so I don't know, I guess I'll just go ahead and be a hater a little bit. Um, I also watched the, the documentary, thought it was great. I, was a little bit can i say disappointed um because it felt like a celebration of people who mostly already made it and um i'm really like i'm fascinated by the history of the studio museum in harlem when i was at kalamazoo we um i worked i helped to work on an exhibition that was a traveling exhibition from their collection. And at Kalamazoo, we showed almost a hundred works from their collection um, that were just fantastic, absolutely stellar. We were the only Midwestern venue in the US to show it. Um, so I love the work. I love the institution for being there and for being the repository that it is. At the same time, as a teacher, I'm you know trying to prepare my lesson plan for how I'm going to introduce this important institution and the artwork and everything and contextualize it in time and place. At, at the same time that the Studio Museum in Harlem was founded in 1968, the Museum of the Afro American Artist was founded in Boston in 1968. Um, and John Wilson actually was a very important player in the founding of that institution and um, in creating artworks for that institution. And to see how the Studio Museum has evolved and to see the kind of stasis, really, of the Afro-American Museum in Boston, it's, it's tragic. It's absolutely mm -hmm. tragic. Um, and in the neighborhood where it's located, it's the last majority black neighborhood, historically majority black neighborhood in Boston that hasn't been gentrified yet. And that is simply because our elders who are the homeowners haven't died and sold their uh, houses yet. 
So this neighborhood is being circled and targeted by real estate agents like on a daily basis. I know this because my father now owns a home that was owned by my grandmother in that neighborhood. And my great aunt who is over 90 years old owns a home that is on within walking distance of that institution. Um, and it doesn't have nearly the type of capital that it deserves and needs in order to function effectively. It doesn't have nearly the type of um, cultural cachet, right? Um, and part of that is about the history of Boston and how black people have been pushed out of that city and how black people have been kept out of certain labor markets as professionals, right? And this is not a unique story in the US. This is a story that takes place in every city. And so you're right, we need more of this because we need to know these historic landmarks before we lose the opportunity to tell those stories and learn from them, right? For example, one of the founders of the Afro-American Museum in Boston was a West Indian woman named Elma Lewis. Elma Lewis was a, I won't cuss, excuse me, was a powerhouse. Right? Mm -hmm. She was a powerhouse and she brought John Coltrane to perform in Boston. She helped to open up this uh, museum for visual artists. She started a community arts project, um, looking at theater and dance and using that, right? Her house is right across the street from my grandmother's house and has been sold. There's no historic landmark. Mm. And it's a young white family that moved in to an otherwise all black street and neighborhood, right? So like I said, the time is ticking. The time is ticking. And the resource that is represented by the HBO documentary is, is absolutely beautiful. At the same time, it's like, are we just gonna share the things that already have the cachet? Or are we going to also invest in the black artistic infrastructure <laughs> that is like all American infrastructure at this current moment, decaying and eroding. So that's my two cents on the matter. And Fredro, you 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 asked about uh, about sustainability. Um, you know, a number of, there's this country is filled with organizations that are run by by black by black um institution um uh operators my, myself included and they are they are grossly under resourced they do the work that they do and they do the work that Thank they you. do with optimal acumen um and they they basically they're basically turning lemons into lemonade right so what with whatever small resources they have access to there's there's many of them are still able to do an impeccable job even though you know the broader institution refuses to acknowledge them as as an important that was that was something else that also um used to annoy me about 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 the 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 i guess the commercial art market is that a number of the art galleries that i now work with right which are are, are run by black operators, the, 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 the art market wouldn't acknowledge them by accepting their applications to those to these larger art fairs. They're starting to do it now because people have been hemming and hawing about it. And, and, and now, and, and with last year become, being an issue, now they're, they, they're, they're making, they're taking the initiative to be inclusive of black owned, by black owned galleries. But prior to that, you were, I mean, you, you rarely heard about Peg Alston or Bill Hodges or, you know, the Anamdi Gallery or, you know, Richard Beaver's Gallery. Like th these are galleries and Stella Jones down in New Orleans. I mean, I literally had to do my own extensive research. And it's not to say that these galleries don't, don't work with important artists. A lot of the artists that we know as, you know, um, uh, venerable artists who are contributing to, to, to the artistic canon and our African American went through these went through these galleries. Mertiz Berdola, for instance, who um, has a gallery in Maryland, was um, Amy Sherald's um, representative before she went to Hauser and Worth. You know, so 
you know, I think I think there was just a lack of acknowledgement too of um, a number of institutions, whether they be commercially driven or um, practicum driven. Um, we just don't acknowledge black operated spaces, um, and um, that's a serious problem. They need dollars. They need support the same way you know the Whitney or the Met or any other <laughs> institution needs it. Um, and they do good work. I mean, Studio Museum has a support. Um, you know, the, the African American Smithsonian has a support, but there's a number of institutions that are like the, like, for instance, the, um, the Museum of African Di Diaspora in San Francisco, they need support, you know, and that's a great institution. Um, the CAM in California in, um, in, in Los Angeles needs support. That's a great institution as well. And there's a number, there's a number of others that really need the continued, the continued support. So I just, right. uh, and I completely agree with what you're saying. I would just say that we need that support more than the Whitney and mm -hmm. the MoMA, right? Okay. Like, just like those places are always, you know, saying that they need more support. We need that support times a million. Times 10. <laughs> times one, like times a million. <laughs> totally. Do, um, does anyone have any questions or or Fari Mikkel, do you have questions for each other um, that you would like to ask? I have a question for you, Mikhail. I have been admiring the Prism Art Fair from afar, and it was definitely in the back of my mind as I was um, organizing the color block. And I just and and as I was organizing my own independent exhibition, right? Because you're because you are saying the same thing I was saying, which is where is the platform? Where's mm -hmm. the platform? Oh, it's not here. Let me build it. So, can you just tell us about one of your proudest Prism moments? I think it was actually having Dr. Driscoll had do a keynote at Prism. That was uh that was absolutely because um so the University of Maryland um the doc the doctor um the doctor David C Driscoll Center um had been a, a supporter of Prism for several years I think for about four years of our programming and then um sadly literally the year before he passed away um he was our keynote speaker um and um and he was talking about his legacy um. So that was that was one of my proud moments, but I think every I think for me every year I have a proud moment because every year I'm always like I can't believe <laughs> like this is happening for another year <laughs> like um, I'm always very because it's a lot of work um, and it's really it really does take um, a lot of resources um, for us to deploy this every year. Um, so for me, I'm just always very happy that we're even able to do it because I know that a number of institutions like like Prism are looking for uh, are under resourced and looking for support, and we've been lucky and we've been mm -hmm. um, we've been I guess um, celebrated by people um, um, by our patrons for a, a while, which means that what we're doing is important to a lot of people. Um, so. I think for me, the proud moment is just is just our ability to keep on to keep on going. Um, and I get I get a lot of satisfaction out of doing what we do. Um, and I'm glad that it has been such a fruitful and robust um, uh, platform for a lot of the artists and practitioners that we work with, because we also um, we also have curators come and um, do panel talks about their practices as well. It's really, it's really, it's really a, a platform to support uh, a multidisciplinary um, um, spectrum of work that happens within the arts. Uh, we invite um, um, curators to, to 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 talk about their work. We invite journalists to talk about their work, um, particularly art journalists. Uh, we invite um, folks who, are, who do more professional work around the, the asset management of art to, to come and talk about taking care of your collection, those sorts of things. So it really is a, a resource for, pe for, for folks who, who want to do it. And what I also get a lot of pleasure out of is people 
telling me that they feel like they they feel welcome in prison. Um, I get the most satisfaction of that, and I get the most fat satisfaction from folks telling me that they they this is the first time they've ever collected artwork before. Like that to me, that's actually what I love the most is having people who've never who've never collected work before and have felt uncomfortable doing it in other spaces coming to Prism and saying that they feel like they can do it here without feeling rejected by the space. Yeah. And my question for you, um, uh, Fari, is what do you what what how do you want people to receive the color block and and how do you want it to um impact the broader um, um arts ecosystem like what do you want color blocks a legacy to be and how do you want it how do you want it to impact the art the arts market the art the arts institution thank you for that question um well what i how i want it to be received by the people who are within the network is as a relevant tool and a resource so a number of people have told me that they landed the position they're now in because somebody posted it in the color block um i've seen people say hey i'm doing a video shoot i need a dp can somebody hit me up um you know i see the legacy of the color block as being a space in which artists and art workers can organize with one another to um, execute what it is that they have in mind. So um, whether that is a space to just share information so that each person knows when their exhibition is coming up or when their concert is happening or when their video shoot needs extras, right? Um, or whether it's like actual skill sharing the whole point for me is for it to be a relevant tool and resource so that black and other people of color um, in the arts can make more better art that's really mm -hmm. it so you know now that i find myself in ohio i'm wondering is this something that people in ohio feel would be necessary right mm -hmm. right um i think that for a lot of museums and just in the art world in general and just in the world in general where we have to deal with issues of institutional institutional racism um the the excuse is always like oh well we just don't know where to find people or we just don't know anybody or right and so um they so these institutions can easily play one against the other um, because they're only opening up one space. And so now everybody has to fight for that one crumb, as opposed to hopefully what the color block um, can offer is let's all come up together. Let's not be in competition with one another. Let's support, let's collaborate, let's build each other up. Um, do you need resources? I've got access to resources. Here, let me share that with you. You need information? I've got access to information. Here, let me share that with you. You need to know somebody who has a venue? I know somebody in this group has a venue. Let's put that out there, right? So that we don't have to go to these institutions that have spent their entire institutional lives excluding us, right? It's 2021. And people are just now, you know, hiring the first black this or that. It's shameful. And, and while at the same time, yes, we want to celebrate that one individual's come up. It's, you know, for the for the whole field to still be having these firsts and firsts and firsts, it's it's a problem. It's a major, serious, huge problem. And so why would you continue to go? to those places where you know the doors are closed to you, as opposed to pooling your smarts, pooling your resources, putting your talents to the service of others and doing the work together so that you don't need those other institutions and those other exclusionary systems. So that's always been in the back of my mind 
um, when I helped to co-found it and as I continue to try to maintain, you know, the presence of the color block and the um, efficacy of it. I'm, I'm very thankful for the work that you're doing. Um, and I, I really, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing um, new developments and projects that you all work on together. Um, and I would love to collaborate with you. That's another thing that- uh, Girl, that same, say less, <laughs> say less. <laughs> That's how I feel about you. I yeah. think that you are such an amazing trailblazer. And it's yeah. like, you know, the prism art fair it needed to happen and the fact that you recognize that and you made it happen is like yeah that's that's what we need that's we need more of that everywhere yes please yeah. so i'm so in enamored and in awe and you know and it's such a resource too you know because when else do you have that many black curators coming together to talk about this or that when else do you have you know everything that's in everybody's minds coming together in one place. That's, mm -hmm. I think, the, one of the most difficult aspects of living in the US in this time is how ingrained the individualism is and how it is absolutely pushing against the current and against the stream when you wanna do something as a community, as a collective, as a collaboration. it We don't have systems and structures set up for that, you know? And so you really have to go against that in order to, um, in order to do the kinds of work and have the kinds of social relations that Black people have been trying to hold on to since the moment of capture, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, but I do think that the, um, you know, historically, if you look at the history of um, um, culture and in, in, in the African American community, um, the African Amer American community is very com it, it is community based. Like everything that we've done historically has been in community. Um, like we built right. communities. You have you had Tulsa before it, its unfortunate demise. You know, you had um, Rosewood in, yep. in, in Florida. I mean, there we we are a deeply in even in Africa, we are very we ha we are tribal. We are we are very community oriented um, um, ethnicity. Um, so, you know, I I always try to do things in community. I'm always trying to think about how what I can do, what I'm doing, can be a resource to other people, um, because that's really the only way um, we can all. Um, sustain each other. Um, nobody does anything by themselves. It's impossible. Um, right. So it, it, um, sustainable living requires collective action and community. It's just necessary. So. Well, we are at the end of the hour. I was wondering if anyone had any questions for our two guests. If not, I'll ask one quick last question. Um, can you share with us, um, just um, name a couple of artists or art professionals who are doing work that you find particularly exciting, whether it's at the individual or collective level? Um, I'm excited about there's so I mentioned an artist. He's from South Africa earlier. His name his name is uh, Stenjwa Luthuli. Uh, he's from uh, Cape Town, South Africa. Um, beautiful work. He's a printmaker. Um, I went to his studio the last time I was. We were allowed to get on planes for long for long periods of time, um, and I was absolutely blown away. Um, I, I, you know, I, I would say that a lot of the work that emanates from South Africa is most of the artists that I, I've had the pleasure of meeting there produce beautiful work and it's usually deeply political because of the history of South Africa. Um, I'm, 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 I'm very much attracted to work that challenges um, um, political structures and, uh, you know, social norms, et cetera. Um, 
uh, and and his work is a combination. It's both beautiful, but then also does um, have political narratives um, woven into his work. Um, and then on the curatorial side, I'm very I, I can't wait to see um, what Naomi Beckwith will do when she when she goes to the Guggenheim. Um, uh, I really she she. I, the only time I, I, I'd ever really seen her work was at um, at the MCA in Chicago um, for Howardina Pendel's retrospective. And I thought it was such a beautiful show. Um, so I don't really know much. I, I, I've, I've, done, I've read about her and I've never had a chance to meet her, but I've always found whatever I read about her to be very compelling. And so I'm interested to see how she can turn around, a mu or if she will turn around a museum that has deep, uh, contra controversial, controversial um, issues as it pertains to diversity and and um, 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 progressive th um, thought. Um, I'm I'm curious to see how her leadership there will help them change their their narrative, if it will. Um, and what she will do to change its narrative. Um, yeah, um, I think those are two, two, two that I'm very interested. In. And then, of course, I'm interested in what Fari's doing with the color block, <laughs> for sure. Um, right. I would say that one, someone I keep my eye on is Mikhail Sullivan. Right. Um, <laughs> but I also put in the chat. Uh, Latanya Autry, who on the internet, um, if you follow her on Twitter or on um, Instagram, she goes by Art Stuff Matters. Um, she mm -hmm. is presently in the last few days of a curatorial position. I think it was a termed fellowship at the um, Museum of Contemporary Art in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. She just opened a, a magnificent um, multi sided show called Imagine Otherwise. Um, and it's beautiful. It features the work of Shai Keith, who is a Philadelphia photographer at um, Mocha Cleveland. And then there are two black operated arts spaces in Cleveland that she's also used as sites to exhibit work. Um, one of those places is called the Museum of Creative Human Art. Yeah, and the and the acronym is MOCA. Um, and the other one is called Third Space Arts. And so I was just really excited to, to know about those venues because again, they exist in every city and even in rural areas. It's just that we don't know about them. Um, and so she is someone whose work is in, incredibly um, intellectually sound, incredibly mm -hmm. rich, drawing on um, African American scholarship as well as indigenous scholarship um, to really mm -hmm. think about how her curatorial practice can push forward the narrative of abolition. How it can, how can artists, curators, and people who just enjoy art in general participate in creating and imagining an otherwise, you know, status quo, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so when I first learned about her work, um, she's also the progenitor of the hashtag museums are not neutral. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, this is what I'm talking about. This is the type of stuff I wanna be doing. I hadn't seen a curator be able to be as outspoken and political and blackity blackity black until mm -hmm. that moment. And then I was like, oh, okay, so I guess I can maybe I can do this, right? Um, maybe there is a space for me. Maybe there is something that I can contribute in, in my own very far way. Um, so I absolutely adore her as a as a arts professional, as a creative thinker, as an intellectual, um, and as a friend. Um, who else can I can I name? There's another black woman curator out of Detroit whose name is Juana Williams. Um, no, and awesome. right, Juana, oh, she's awesome. I got the I chance to see her work when she was yeah. at the. Um, you something something inner 
something contemporary art up in Grand Rapids. And uh, mm -hmm. she had a wonderful show whose name I don't remember, but it was all about um, African descended women artists imagining the future. So it was very Afrofuturistic. Um, and it featured the work of some of my favorite artists. And so I got to the exhibition and I was just like, I love this artist's work. I love this artist's work. I love this artist's work. Oh my God, they're all here. It's amazing. I had never <laughs> seen them together in one place, like a Brianna McCartney, um, who is, I think, from Barbados. Barbados and yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Um, Don Okoro, who else was in the show? Oh gosh, now I'm blanking on some of the names, but you know, I was just blown away by um, the way that she was able to create a whole new different space out of this, you know, staid white arts institution. Mm -hmm. um, she has since left that institution for reasons that any black museum curator could understand. Um, but I just, I think it's so important not only to uplift the work of Black artists, but also to uplift the work of Black curators. And that's something that I am learning more about, um, you know, who came before me, who who's really innovating and breaking open the field, who's really having conversations that are resounding outside of, you know, the hallowed walls of the institutions. Um, and so, yeah, I just absolutely adore their work and admire them so much and feel really grateful to be able to, um, you know, like hit them up and ask them questions and ask for advice and like, you know, commiserate and just key key um, mm -hmm. because all of that is so, so important to um, being able to like move this work forward. Mm -hmm. Um, Fredo, another another I think uh, valuable resource. Um, it's not they're not necessarily um, uh, curators, but um, uh, uh, a friend of mine named Melissa Hunter Davis publishes a magazine called Sugarcane. Yeah, that is yeah. focused on Black diaspora, That's not right. just visual art, but um, everything, whether it be cultural performing projection. arts, cult, it's just cultural projection, um, and um, it's such a valuable resource. Um, um, she she brings in different um, uh, writers, and and most of her writers are from the Black diaspora. Um, so you get um, to read about the work through the lens of and through the lens of African American um, intelligentsia, um, and um, and so I really admire her publication for that. Um, and then there's another um, curator who just actually left. Uh, Oh gosh, what's the name of the museum in Indian, Indi Indianapolis that had some? <gasps> yes, um, oh. girl. <laughs> oh yes, I didn't want to keep their core white audience, honey. <laughs> um, right, New Fields. Um, New Fields. Yes, Blue yeah. Fields. New Fields. Right, right. So Kelly Morgan was a curator right. who used to right. work there. Right. Kelly yep. Morgan yep. is such an amazing resource. I remember I had a conversation with her that literally went four hours because she just knew so much. And we were talking, we were talking, I, I met her at, a, um, when she was working at PAFA in Philadelphia. Um, and um, subsequently we had a conversation and we were talking about Jacob Lawrence and we were talking about Norman Lewis. And this woman knows the history of these two men and other masters, um, other African-American masters in like a sort of as as, as, if, as if she was their contemporary, like she was able to like talk about conversations they had. Like she was just an immersed in the in the in the history of African American art in ways that I I haven't even heard like venerated art curators talk about about art before. I was like totally blown away um, by my conversations with her, and I and I hope I hope that. Um, there'll be more platforms for her because I just, she's just so amazing. Um, uh, so yeah, Kelly is another good one, I think. Mm -hmm. You guys are a fantastic resource and we could probably um, just mm -hmm. make a list all evening of wonderful things we should know about, but I know people do have to get on and do other things now. And I'm going to have to bid you all a fond farewell but do come visit us in Grinnell. Definitely. We could use you there. We need your energy. 
I'm sure Fredo will find a way to get you there. <laughs> I'd be happy to meet Iowa, but preferably in the summer. Preferably right. in the summer. Right. Right. <laughs> yes. yes. Once the snow melts. <laughs> yeah. But thank you so much. Thank you both very much. And Fredo, thank you for putting this together. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having and, us. And thank, thank you. you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you both so much, and thank you to the museum for hosting this. And I hope we can continue to have these kinds of conversations and sharing of resources Absolutely. in the future. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Bye for now.